Hello, hello. I'm back here at City Hall. I'm going teaching, say their name square. Rainy mist blowing on the wind. Get my book wet. To keep things dry. We're, I'm reading uh, the book Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. Um, we're on chapter 24, uh, cortisol, telomeres, and the lethality of caste. A young man immigrated from Nigeria at the age of 17 to attend college in the United States. His father paid the tuition at the end of the and at the end of the first semester the young man went on went to pick up the refund at the bursar's office. You speak very good English, the clerk told him. And then the Nigerian man excoriated the clerk. Of course I speak good English, he said. I speak English better than many Americans. I speak other languages as well. Don't ever say that again. Right. He discovered that in America, he was not seen for his skills or his education. He was seen as, a, as black before anything else. It was an identity he was unaccustomed to that had no meaning back home where everyone had similar coloring. Now it seemed to mean everything. The African Americans were always talking about being profiled and mistreated, and he hadn't paid it much attention at first, but the longer he was in the United States, the more he shed his accent, as immigrants often do, and the more Americanized the, he became, the more he be, began to experience life not as an immigrant, not solely as a Nigerian, but as a black man in a hierarchy that disfavored people who looked like him. Women clenched their, clenched their purses as he approached, shrank from him on the elevator, crossed the street to avoid... Oh, Steve. Anyway. Street to avoid pa passing near him. He was followed in stores as if he were a felon and the authorities questioned him more intensely than he was accustomed to. More intensely than the white man, he noticed. A white driver locked her door when he merely drove up in traffic one day. He went and locked his door too to show that he was as concerned for his safety as she was. He found himself passed over for promotions as a compliance officer and despite his seniority and experience he was laid off and he wondered as many people assigned to the subordinate cast cannot help but consider if race had anything to do with it before coming to America he would have thought it pre preposterous maybe the African Americans were not working hard enough were not educated enough. Now, having lived longer in the United States than in Nigeria, he knew better than to dismiss what they said out of hand. Once, when he pulled into a parking space, an older white woman whose car he had parked next to turned and stared, then recoiled backward in her driver's seat. I see her, he told the passenger in the car with him. I don't give a shit. Except, actually, he did, or rather, his physiology did. Modern medicine has long sought to to attribute to higher 
attribute the higher rates of disease in African Americans relative to white Americans to genetics, but it turns out that sub-Saharan Africans do not have high rates of high blood pressure, diabetes, and heart disease, while African Americans have the highest rates of those conditions of all ethnic groups in the United States. The Nigerian man now in America was living this too. My father lived to 90 years old, the man said. He had no high blood pressure until the last day of his life. I just want to be, I just want, I just went to the doctor and he tells me I have high blood pressure and early signs of diabetes, he said, and I am just 54. The effects of spending my entire adult life as a black man in this country are making me sick. Forty years ahead of my own father back in Nigeria. The friction of caste is killing people. Societal inequity is killing people. The fact of moving about and navigating spaces with those whom society has trained us to believe are inherently different from us is killing us and not just the targets studies are showing that prejudice itself can be deadly neuroscientists have found that harboring this kind of animus can raise a person's blood pressure and cortisol levels even during benign social interactions with people of different races wrote this neuropsychologist Elizabeth Page Gould prejudice itself can be deadly these physical reactions can put the person at greater risk for stroke or diabetes or heart attacks and premature death a study of white Americans who scored high on a measure of automatic prejudice meaning the degree to which they associate certain ethnic groups with negative stereotypes at the level of the unconscious, found that when they were put into situations where they were, for example, to be interviewed for a job by an African American or to have social interaction with Latinos, they perceived the people of a different ethnicity as a threat, even in a safe laboratory setting. The threat they perceived as a result of their prejudice set off their body's alarm system. Their panic produced automatic physio physiological responses as would occur if they were in combat or confronting an oncoming car. Restricted blood flow to the heart, the flooding of the muscles with the glucose as the body releases cortisol, the hormone useful in the rare moment when one might need to escape danger, but dam damaging to the body on a regular basis. The combination of reduced blood flow, restrictions to the circulatory and digestive systems, and the breakdown of muscle by cortisol can lead to life-threatening damage to the heart and the immune system and to death before one's time. Even the briefest exposure is all it takes to activate the body's response. Among whites, the sight of a black person, even in faded yearbook photographs, can trigger the am, uh, amygdala am, am of the brain to perceive threat and arm itself to for vigilance within 30 milliseconds of exposure the blink of an eye researchers have found when whites have a bit more time for the conscious mind to override the automatic feeling of threat they the m amygdala activity switches to inhibition mode when whites are prompted to think of the black person as an individual Imagine their personal characteristics, the threat level falls. This shows that it is possible to override our worst impulses and reduce these prejudices, wrote the psychologist Susan Fisk. But to do so in a meaningful way requires forethought, an awareness of the unconscious bias, biases passed down through the generations and the chance for people 
different from one another to work together as equals on the same team with shared goals. that require a cooperation to succeed, Fisk said. Outside of sports and the military, American society provides a few such opportunities. This leaves many Americans at risk without knowing it. As they go about their days interacting with coworkers, neighbors, contractors, or other ordinary people perceived as unlike them, Selves, they can be in danger of worsened health and premature illness due to threats, signal signals triggered by the person's own unaddressed prejudice. Um, what I got to say about this is that, um, that it takes work to be anti-racist in the United States. Um, if anybody tells you that they were born anti-racist and that they they've never felt these things they're lying it's per pervasive in society and you're trained and you have to fight against these unconscious bias biases um On the other side of the caste system, scientists have connected a key indicator of health and longevity, the length of human telomeres, to one's exposure to inequality and discrimination, primarily focusing on the telomere lengths of African Americans. A telomere is a repeating sequence of double-stranded DNA at the end of a chromosome. The more frequently a cell divides, the shorter the telomere become, wearing out the cell in a process that public health scientists Arlene Geronimus in her pioneering 1992 work termed weathering. It is a measure of premature aging of the cells, and thus of the person bearing those cells, and of the on early onset of disease due to chronic exposure to such stressors as discrimination, job loss, or obesity. These studies initially focused on the accelerated aging of the telomeres of African Americans, but expanded research is finding that the key to cell damage results from one's exposure to social inequity and difficult life conditions rather than merely one's race ethnic and ethnicity. Thus the telomeres of poor whites, for example, are shorter than those of wealthier whites whose resources might better help them weather life's challenges. The opposite is true for people in the lower castes in America's America socioeconomic status and the presumed privilege that comes with it do not protect the health of well-to-do African Americans. In fact, many suffer a health penalty for their ambitions. Middle-class African American men and women are more likely to suffer from hypertension and stress than those with lower incomes, wrote the sociologist George <sighs> Lipsitz. Lipsitz. The stigma and stereotypes they labor under expose them to higher levels of stress-inducing discrimination in spite of, or perhaps because of, their perceived educational or material advantages. The pattern up the, the pattern applies to other another marginalized group Mex, Mexicans in America. It turns out that poor Mexican immigrants have long longer telomeres, meaning healthier, younger cells than better off Mexican Americans. Poorer Mexicans are likely to be 
newer to this country and to cluster together in closer support networks, their isolation from the mainstream and the language barrier could inadvertently insulate them from the discrimination that more affluent Mexicans may face as they navigate the caste system on a daily basis. Those who were born in the United States or have lived in the country for many years would have greater exposure to the damaging effects of stereotyping and stigma. All of these groups appear to be playing a price when paying a price when they step outside of the roles assigned them in the hierarchy. High levels of everyday discrimination contribute to narrowing the arteries over time, said the Harvard social scientist David R. Williams. High levels of discrimination lead to higher levels of inflammation, a marker of heart disease. People who face discrimination, Williams said, often build up a layer of unhealthy fat known as visceral fat surrounding vital vital organs as opposed to subcutaneous fat just under the skin. It is this visceral fat that raises the risk of diabetes and cardiovascular disease and leads to premature death and it can be found in people of all ethnicities based on their experience of discrimination. Black women experience higher levels of discrimination than white women do, Williams said, but when white women experience discrimination, the effects are the same. So discrimination leading to higher levels of visceral fat, that is true for African American women and for white women. When whites report higher levels of discrimination, their health is also hurt. It really says something about the nature of human interaction. Blankets. When it comes to the comes to life expectancy, middle-aged and less educated white Americans are experience a downward trend, as we have seen. But people of color at the bottom of the caste system who bear the brunt of social societal stigma still have an overall lower life expectancy than their white counterparts at every level of education, according to Williams. The average white American at age 25 is likely to live five years longer than the average African American. (sighs) While white high school dropouts have a lower life expectancy than their more educated white counterparts, they live three years longer than African American high school dropouts and white college graduates live four years longer than African-American college graduates. Thus, people of color with the most education who compete in fields where they are not expected to be continually press against the boundaries of caste and experience a lower life expectancy as a result. The more ambitious the marginalized person, the greater the risk of what evolutionary biologists Joseph L. Graves calls the out-of-place principle of social dominance. Graves found that hypertension rates of blacks and whites are roughly the same when affluent African Americans are deleted from the equation. The caste system takes years off the lives of subordinate caste people the more they find themselves in contention with it. There is a black tax that we pay that hurts our health, and the gap is larger among the college educated than it is among high school dropouts, Williams said. We still carry the burden to engage in a heightened vigilance, which means you're careful of how you look, how you appear, how you dress. Williams had a friend, a middle class black businessman, who would never leave the house in the in the sweats and sneakers that his white neighbors wore without a moment's thought. He couldn't afford to. He took great care whenever he left the house, and it took more time and more forethought for even the most casual errand. 
if his wife needed a gallon of milk and he needed to run to the supermarket to get that gallon of milk, he would run into the house to get a jacket and tie, William said. It was the way of trying to minimize the likelihood that he was going to be perceived as criminal because he's a young black male. That is what we live with, and it is taking a toll on our lives. It seems that people in the dominant caste know in their bones that the playing field tilts toward the group they happen to be, have been born into. Years ago, back in the 1990s, the political scientist Andrew Hacker posed a theoretical question to his white undergraduates at Queens College in New York. He asked them how much they would have to be paid to live the next 50 years as a black person. The students thought it over and came back with a figure. Most said they would need $50 million. One million for every year they would have to be black. They felt they would need it, he said, to buy protection from the discriminations and dangers white people know they would face only once they were perceived to be black. Okay, so that's that's uh, the end of chapter 24. Um the end of part five the consequences of caste and chapter 24 was titled cortisol telomeres and the lethality of caste um which really gets to um health uh health outcomes um, because of the caste system, because of discrimination, um, they try to, you know, society to uphold the caste system makes it out that African Americans are genetically inferior or genetically have these these uh, higher rates of, of heart disease and um, high blood pressure and all those things. But what, he, what, what she's saying in this book is that it's caused by the hierarchy. It's caused by, um, and actually it, it affects people with, in a higher class of the subordinate c- caste. So like a, a middle to upper class black person um, in the United States has a higher propensity to for high blood pressure and heart disease and early death than somebody of a lower class. Um, like they said, uh, a college graduate has a lower life expectancy than somebody who dropped out of high school in the subordinate class or caste. So, part Part 6, Backlash. Chapter 25, A Change in the Script. The greatest departure from the script of the American caste system was the election of an African American to the highest office in the land. History has shown that there would be consequences to this disruption of the social order, and there were what follows, and there were, What follows is not an analysis of the presidency of Barack Obama, but rather a look into the caste system's response to this ascension and the challenges it would place in its path. First, to break more than two centuries of tradition and birthright, it would take the human equivalent of a supernova, a Harvard-trained lawyer, a U.S. senator from the land of Lincoln, 
whose expertise was the Constitution itself, whose charisma and oratory matched or exceeded that of most any man who had ever risen to the Oval Office, whose unusual upbringing inclined him toward conciliation of the racial divide, who famously saw the country as not blue states or red states, but as the United States, whose wife, if it could be imagined, was also a Harvard-trained lawyer with as much star power as her husband, who, together with their two young daughters, made for a telegenic American dream family, and who, beyond all this, ran a scrupulous, near flawless campaign, a movement, really. It would take an idealist who believed what most Americans would have sworn was impossible for a black man to make it to the White House. Secondly, his, op- his opponent, a beloved and aging war hero from Arizona, a wise and measured moderate Republican in a party that had grown more conservative, ran a less than energetic campaign and made several misjudgments, the most significant of which was choosing an unpredictable former governor of Alaska, a woman prone to gaffes and to quick, quirky word salad misstatements as his running mate. Then, in the months leading up to the election, a a once-in-a-generation financial catastrophe descended on a country that seemed on the brink of financial ruin under the Republican administration then in power. Wall Street firms collapsed before our eyes, and the value of American homes, the primary source of many citizens' wealth, plunged in value, leaving millions of boaters underwater. In October 2008, a few weeks before the election, envelopes arrived in the mailboxes of millions of American households, mailings that became inadvertent leaflets in favor of the Democrat, the quarterly 401k statements that showed losses of as much as 40% of people's savings in the last year under the Republican's president. By that November, some 12 million homeowners owed more on their mortgages than their houses were worth in what was now being called the Great Recession, among the worst economic downturns since the Great Depression. People in the dominant caste who might have been on the fence about taking a chance on an African-American candidate were looking at massive losses with no end in sight. Hope had been Obama's mantra during times that badly needed it. A record tide of people from the lower and middle castes, people who swelled with pride and whose votes now felt like a mission, came out for him, and along with just enough dominant caste voters who believed in him too, swept Obama into the White House. The world was a joyous was so joyous that a committee in Norway awarded him the Nobel Peace Prize within months of his inauguration. Only very rarely has a person to the same extent as Obama captured the world's attention, the Nobel Committee said, and given its people hope for a better future. Over the course of American history, the idea of a black man in the Oval Office was virtually unthinkable. But from a caste perspective and beyond his own personal gifts, his singular origin story was one that the caste system would be more willing to accept, if any. His growing up in Hawaii, the son of an immigrant from Kenya and a white woman from Kansas, was free from the heaviness of slavery and Jim Crow and the hard histories of regular African Americans. His story did not trigger the immediate discomfort in the dominant caste, unlike those of everyday black people who, if you scratch their family trees long enough, you run into a sharecropper cheated at settlement or an ancestor shut out of a neighborhood because of redlining. People for whom 
these injustices were not history, but their own of their of their four parents' actual lives. Rather, his origin story freed people in the dominant caste from having to think about the unsavory corners of American history. They could regard him with curiosity and wonderment and even claim him as part of themselves if they chose. They could perhaps feel a connection to his mother and to his mother's mother, who tragically died just before Election Day. Both women were from the dominant caste and would not get to see how very far he would go in this world. The Delaware senator who would become his running mate, though, seemed to be speaking, however awkwardly, for some others in the ruling majority. You've got the first sort of mainstream African American who is articulate and bright and clean and nice looking guy, said Joe Biden. I mean, that's a storybook, man. After the election, white Americans in both parties extolled the progress the country had made in the past generation, relieved to be able to say that racism was a thing of the past. We have a black president, for heaven's sake. They would say, the way of example, by way of example, the fact is, though, this was a development that the majority of the dominant caste was not truly in a position to claim. The majority of white voters did not support him in either of his presidential bids. He had star power and a way with babies and pensioners, but no matter how refined and inspirational, well-spoken and conciliatory he was, Obama's victory did not occur because most voters in the dominant caste had become more open-minded and enamored of him. As with other recent Democrats running for president, he won despite the bulk of the white electorate. Even as they proclaimed new post-racial world, the majority of white Americans did not vote for the country's first black president. An estimated 43% went for him in 2008, thus a solid majority of white Americans. Nearly three out of every five white voters did not back him in his first election, and fewer still, 39% voted for him in 2012. The former Confederate state of Mississippi, Mississippi, only one in ten white voters pulled the lever for Obama. For much of his presidency, he was trying to win over people who did not want him in the Oval Office and some who resented his very existence. As a measure of the enduring role of caste interests in American politics, the shadow of the Civil War seemed to hang over the 2008 election. It turned out that Obama carried every state that Abraham Lincoln had won in 1860. An election with an almost entirely white electorate, but one that became a proxy for egalitarian sentiment and for the future of slavery in the republic. The cultural divides of the Civil War on racial grounds, wrote the political scientist Patrick Fisher of Seton Hall University, can thus be still be considered to be influencing American political culture a century and a half later. Lyndon B. Johnson, after signing the 1964 Civil Rights Act, is said to have predicted that the Democrats would lose the South for a generation for having stood up for the citizenship rights of African Americans. That prophecy would prove to be correct, but also an understatement. The Democrats would lose more than just the South, and for well longer than a generation. From that moment forward, white Americans overall moved rightward toward the Republicans as the country enacted more egalitarian policies. In the more than half century since the prophecy of 1964, no Democrat running for president has ever won a majority of the white vote. Lyndon Johnson was the last Democrat to win the presidency with a majority of the white electorate. Since that time, the Democrats who came closest, who attracted the largest percentage of white voters 
at 48% was fellow Southerner Jimmy Carter in 1976. Only three Democrats have made it to the Oval Office since the, John, since the Johnson and the Civil Rights era. Carter, Obama, and Clinton, who won with 39% of the white vote in 1992 and 44% in 1996. With whites pulling away from the Democrats and accustomed to prevailing in presidential elections through their sheer numbers, the outcome of the 2008 election was seen not merely as the defeat of John McCain, but perhaps a defeat of the historic ruling majority itself. A challenge to the absoluteness of white dominance, wrote the political scientist Ashley Jardina of Duke University, who specializes in the behavior of the white electorate. Combined with census projections of an end of the white majority by 2042, Obama's victory signaled that the dominant caste could undergo a not altogether certain but still unthinkable wane in power over the destiny of the United States and over the future of themselves and their children and their sovereign place in the world. The symbolism of Obama's election was a profound loss to white status, Jardina wrote. This was something that not this was something that no one in the dominant caste or any other group in the country, for that matter, had ever had to contemplate. It meant that people who had always been first now had to consider the potential loss of their centrality. For many, the ability of a black person to supplant the racial caste system, wrote the political scientist Andrea, Andra Gillespie of Emory University, was the manifestation of a nightmare which would need to be re resisted. That sense of fear and loss, however remote, brought to the fore for many whites, Jardina wrote, a sense of commonality attachment and solidarity with their racial group, a sense of needing to band together to protect their place in the hierarchy. The caste system sprang into action against the th this threat to the pre-existing order. The single most important thing we want to achieve, said Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, Republican of Kentucky, on the eve of the midterm elections in 2010, is for President Obama to be a one-term president. Well, that didn't work out for you. The opposition party would not succeed in denying him a second term, but would obstruct virtually every proposal he made and force him to resort to executive orders to accomplish his aims. Within nine months of his inauguration, the president was addressing a joint session of Congress on his health care plan when a heckler interrupted an ordinarily state affair of pomp and ritual by yelling, You lie! The outburst came from a Republican congressman from South Carolina, Joe Wilson, it was considered so out of order that the House of Representatives passed a resolution of disapproval against Wilson and Senator John McCain, the Republican who lost to Obama in 2008, declared that there was no place for it in that setting or any other. In early 2012, Air Force One landed just outside Phoenix for a presidential visit to a manufacturing plant in Arizona. A routine stop at the start of an election year in which the president would be seeking a second term. There on the tarmac to greet the president was Jan Brewer, the state's Republican governor. The encounter quickly turned tense for such a moment of formality. As the wind rustled the tarmac, the governor, blonde and slight of build, handed the president an envelope and soon she was looking stern and agitated at him. She jabbed her finger at the leader of the free world inches from his nose. 
her mouth in mid-yell like a principal scolding a child facing detention. In the photograph of their encounter, the president appears calm and stoic, if slightly bemused, which had been his usual demeanor, as, as she sticks her finger in his face as if to be saying, and another thing, in some countries and with previous presidents, this might be seen as an act of aggression, a threat to a nation's head of state, a display of profound disrespect were it to happen at all. The photograph was would become one of the defining images of the opposition and resentment President Obama faced in office. The difference in the accomplishments of these two people would not have been apparent from the optics of who was chastising whom. While the president was a graduate of Columbia and of Harvard Law School and had made a methodical march from state senator to U.S. senator to the Oval Office, the woman with the temerity to point her finger in his face had a two-year certificate as a radiology technician and had risen to the governor's mansion by accident of succession after having been secretary of state. She was now a governor, one out of 50 compared to the U.S. president, the highest office in the land and the most powerful in the world. But Governor Brewer was from the dominant caste. Her birth ascribed status seen as inherently above his, and she did not shrink from a gesture that had the look of putting a man from the subordinate caste in his place, no matter his station. The disagreement on the tarmac had presumably arisen over a passage in a book she had written in which she described a meeting the two of them had had some time before, a depiction that he considered inaccurate. In it, she had complained that he thought he could lecture me and I would learn at his knee. The envelope she handed him was an invitation to see the Arizona border with Mexico, given that they had differing views on border security. Afterward, Governor Brewer denied what everyone else could see. I was not hostile, she told reporters. I was trying to be very, very gracious. She went as far as to say that it was, in fact, the she who felt unsafe. I felt a little bit threatened, if you will, in the attitude uh, that he had, she said, even though the exchange had been in full view of cameras and Secret Service and elected officials. You lie. And despite the fact that it was she, after all, who was wagging her finger in, the, in his face, not the other way around, the encounter put the governor in the spotlight for the moment, and she... Okay, we got... Battery issues. The encounter put the governor in the spotlight for the for the moment, and she used it to raise money for her political action committee, according to news reports at the time, and to fire up her base. She told potential donors that the message she was really giving the president that day was, you have one more year. The entire machinery had moved into place upon the arrival of the first head of state from the subordinate caste. A new party of right-wing detractors arose in his wake, the Tea Party, vowing to take our country back. A separate movement of skeptics who would come to be known as birthers challenged the legitimacy of his citizenship and required him to produce an original birth certificate that they chose to disbelieve. His opponents called him the food stamp president and predicted the president and the first lady as simians. At oppos opposition rallies, dis 
people brandished guns and bore signs calling death to Obama. In response to his election, Republicans began changing election laws, making it harder to vote. They did so even more vigorously after the Supreme Court overturned a section of the Voting Rights Act, removing federal election oversight that the states, each with a history of obstructing the minority vote, said was no longer needed. Between 2014 and 2016, States deleted almost 16 million people from voter registration lists, purges that accelerated in the last years of the Obama administration, according to the Brennan Center for Justice. States enacted new voter ID laws even as they created more barriers to obtaining this newly required ID. Together, these actions had the cumulative effect of reducing voter participation of marginalized people and immigrants, both of whom were seen as more likely to vote Democrat. A paper found that states were far more likely to to enact restrictive voting laws, wrote the commentator Jonathan Chait, if minorities turned turnout in their state had recently increased. Contrary to the wistful predictions of post-racial harmony, the number of hate groups in the United States surged from 602 to more than 1,000 between 2000 and 2010, the middle of Obama's first term in office, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center. A 2012 study found that anti-black attitudes and racial stereotyping rose rather than fell, as some might have hoped, to Obama's first term. The, pre- the percentage of Americans who expressed explicit anti-black attitudes ticked upward from 48% to, in 2008 to 51% in 2012. But the percentage expressing implicit bias rose from 49% to 56%. The study found that higher percentages of white respondents now saw African Americans as violent, irresponsible, and most especially lazy after his victory, despite or perhaps because of the studiously wholesome black family in the White House headed by two Ivy League educated parents. With rising resentments, it would not be surprising that attacks on African Americans might not only not have abated, but would worsen under the unprecedented reversal of the social hierarchy. By the second term of the administration in 2015, police were killing unarmed black Americans, African Americans, at five times the rate of white Americans. It was a trend that would make police killings a leading cause of death for young African-American men and boys. These deaths occurring at a rate of 1 in 1,000 young black men and boys. Early on, Obama had taken symbolic steps to bridge the racial divide. He held a beer summit with Henry Louis Gates Jr. and the officer who had arrested Gates as he tried to enter his home near Harvard having called the summit after the uproar over his comments that the police had acted stupidly in arresting the Harvard professor. When Trayvon Martin was killed, Obama observed that it was, if he had a son, the son would have looked like Trayvon. But the caste system rose up and his approval ratings fell after even these benign gestures. The opposition party stood firm, against many of his ambitions and nominees, shutting shutting down the government time and again, refusing to confirm or even consider his Supreme Court nominee, Merrick Garland. The caste system had handcuffed the president as it had handcuffed the African Americans face down on the pavement in the videos that had become part of the landscape. It was 
it was as if the caste system were rem- reminding ev- everyone of their place in the subordinate caste in particular that no matter how the caste of the play was reshuffled, the hierarchy would remain as it always had been. In a paradox of caste, many whites seem to have known this known known this studies show seem to have trusted on some unconscious level that the caste system would hold the first black president and the subordinate caste with which he had come to be associated in check as deeply as some people resented a black man presiding in the oval office most whites in the united states were were not overwhelmingly concerned jardina writes that Obama would favor blacks over their own group. Thus, within the parameters in which he was forced to maneuver, he made more headway in race with race-neutral goals. In doing so, he managed to reshape the country's health care system and lead on such issues as climate change, clean energy, gay marriage, sentencing reform, and investigations into police brutality, that other administrations might have ignored altogether while guiding the country out of recession. But accomplishments from from those considered to have stepped out of their place often only bring more resentment. In this case, inciting the tremors of discontent among those feeling eclipsed by his mere existence. Any upheaval in the universe is terrifying, James Baldwin once wrote, because it is so profoundly attack because it so profoundly attacks one's sense of one's own reality. Which is why Obama's presidency and his high approval ratings mask in an undercurrent of anxiety about our changing nation, according to Jardina. It had a swell of resistance to multiculturalism and a growing backlash to it immigration in november 2012 on the day after the first black president won re-election to a second term rush limbaugh the conservative radio talk show host went on the air and lamented to his listeners i want i went to bed last night thinking we're outnumbered limbaugh said i went to bed last night thinking we've lost the country i don't know how else you look at this that same day, a troubled 64-year-old man in South Florida took the most extreme action imaginable. In the time leading up to the election, according to police, Henry Hamilton, owner of a tanning salon in Key West, told friends, If Barack gets reelected, I'm not going to be around. He kept his word. His body was found in his condominium a day and a half after the the returns came in. Two prescription bottles sat empty in his dining room. Beside him was a handwritten note demanding that he not be revived and cursing the new re-elected president. Good riddance to bad rubbish. That was chapter 25. Um, it was called... A change in the script. Um, we talked about Obama's presidency. And Ari's here. So I think I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to stop this live. And uh, we'll be back, hopefully, with a new reader.